Danielle and you welcome to my vlog. My name is Erin and today we're going to be doing an author interview with my friend Lauren. Hello! Who wrote this book? I did! So tell me a little bit about you. What is your name? What is your job? Shouldn't you know this already? No, it's I should. They don't. That's fine. My name is Lauren Markowitz. Uh, she of the long Polish last name, which is spelled differently than most Poles spell it. I am a historian by training and I have become particularly interested in the history of bison conservation in recent years. I previously worked for Elk Island National Park near Edmonton, which is uh, the center of bison conservation in Canada. It has conservation herds of plains bison and wood bison. And I wrote this book, uh, in fact, for work. I was essentially creating the document that I wish I had been handed my first day because you can't talk to visitors about bison without acknowledging their long history. You really have to talk about that because the past really informs their importance, but also, you know, uh, conservation work today. A lot of people know a little bit about the story of bison conservation. They know in the past, there were lots of bison and now there aren't that many, question mark, question mark. Like if they know anything, they know they're important to First Nations people and they nearly went extinct or maybe are extinct. I've actually encountered people who believe that they're entirely gone. This book is sort of the sequel to the story that people sort of kind of half know. So it talks about um, the history of bison, um, some of the connections with Indigenous people, particularly in what is now Canada, and also goes through the story of destruction, has a photo essay in the middle about the Great Buffalo Roundup of 1907, where I pair stereographs, which are 3D images, with historical newspaper accounts of the period from 1907, all about this crazy roundup as bison were being sent from Montana to Elk Island National Park, and then on to other places as well. Elk Island, again, I mentioned is the seed herd for Canada. So if you've seen bison elsewhere in Canada, there's good odds that they came from Elk Island. And then I go through 20th century history. It's not an incredibly long book. I really tried to design it and write it so it's digestible in one sitting if you really want to. I'm a photo historian as well, so I really, really tried to pick really good historical images and modern images that either have never been published before or have never been published together. So what is your specific job with Parks Canada mm. and how long have you worked within the Parks Canada mm. system? So I've been working for Parks Canada since 2014. I used to work at Elk Island National Park where my official title was long and it was Interpretation Coordination Officer 2. But now I'm an Interpretation Coordination Officer 3 so it was a promotion. Um, I currently work at Prince Albert National Park, which also has a bison herd. It's in Saskatchewan, about two and a half hours north of Saskatoon. And I'm in charge of the folks who do the educational programming. That's what we mean by interpreter. So my staff do things like guided hikes, campfire programs, learn to light a fire, learn to identify plants, you know, all these different things. We're teaching the public about things that are important to the park, even things like bear safety, which is also very important. Yeah. And we talk about bison a bit as well because Prince Albert National Park also has a very small herd of bison, which is a pretty interesting and unique herd in and of itself because the park acquired them accidentally, which is not normally how bison conservation goes. In 1969, there was a small herd released from Elk Island north of the park as kind of an indigenous food source for local First Nations. And they didn't know as much about bison conservation practices as they do today. And they released full grown animals and they're like, be free! And then they were free! And some ended up in Manitoba and were recaptured and brought back to Elk Island. Well, one lone individual ended up a year and a half later being shot outside of Elk Island. They thought it was an escapee. Then Warden Journal says something like, estimated distance traveled 700 miles, shot less than 10 miles east of park boundary. They only figured it out because he had an ear tag and they were like, where did this animal come from? Anyway, but a small herd did make its home in Prince Albert National Park, which is uh, the origin of the herd that's still there today, which I think is really interesting because that herd chose to be there. That's which cool. Which I think is cool. Yeah. So anyway, so all that being said, I like to talk about bison professionally. I currently get paid to do things like go hiking and train staff to do cool things and teach visitors really interesting and important messages. So I think it's a pretty sweet gig if you can get it. Is this your first publication? Yes if you don't count my blog. This was published a year ago under a different title online, but has the same ISBN number. Then the other title was Like Distant Thunder, which I think is a really okay. cool title. Yes, because when I was trying to find this online, the other I was one, like, Parks Canada, what the heck is up with your searches? <laughs> Here's the insider backstory. So we came up with the title Like Distant Thunder, mm -hmm. which is a quote that I actually use in the book because people describe the historical herds, you know, the classic warm one arise into the other. They're, the sound of their hoofbeats sounded like the booming of a distant ocean or like distant thunder, which I was like, whoa, that's such a great title. It is. It is, right? So we were like set on that title, great. So because it's a Parks Canada publication, it's published by the federal government, we had a couple obligations. So we have to make it available to all Canadians. If you want to read this book, you too can go online on Elk Island National Park's website 
and find Like Distant Thunder, Canada's Bison Conservation Story online in French and English. And if you are visually impaired, it's also about full metadata and everything like that. And it should work on your, your readers. If it doesn't, let me know. <laughs> so it's meant to be available for all Canadians and it is free of charge on online downloadable PDF. I personally like to have the physical copy. Mm -hmm. um, so too do many people who like to read these kinds of things. So we intended on printing it and we were like, let's have a nicer title page. Let's put like, make it more visually stunning. I, I quite like this particular image. My boss was just Googling other bison books that have been published in the last 20, 30 years, just to make sure we weren't using the same photograph as someone else or like what are kind of inspiration for different bison related covers. And he found a very small print run of a book from the 90s called Distant Thunder, The Buffalo Story. The author was also quoting the exact same historical source and it was just too close. And so the lawyer said like, no, you got to pick a different title. Oh. And then we thought through the storm because bison famously face into the storm and it's all a metaphor for adversity and things like that. And we thought through the storm because then they're not out of trouble yet, but they've come through a lot of challenges mm -hmm. successfully. So that's why we picked that particular title. So that's why it's under two different titles. We intend on changing the title online as well, but the wheels of government bureaucracy turn slowly. Yes. And the poor IT guy who does all the coding for all the websites for all national parks and national historic sites in Western Canada, he has a lot of stuff on his plate. So uh -huh. the changing the title is a minor thing, unfortunately. Um, in the grand scheme of things, but it'll be, it'll be up. So if you're looking for this particular book, you can find it online under the title, Like Distant Thunder, and then it's available for free as a downloadable PDF. If you want a physical copy currently, you must go to a national park in Canada that has bison in it. So Grasslands National Park, Banff National Park, uh, I believe Waterton Lakes has it as well, Prince Albert National Park, where I'm currently working, and of course, Elk Island National Park's new visitor center and you can buy them there. They're looking at maybe getting it, putting it online, but it's not gonna be appearing on Amazon anytime soon. So this is an exclusive yes. thing. You must go on a quest, find Bison, and then you can pick up a copy of, the physical copy of this book. And I will put a link to Lauren's blog, as well as the links to the book itself in the description below. Tell me about the cover. The cover is kind of fun. So it was made by my friend Cam, who also works for the park. There's one photograph I really, really wanted on the cover. Let's hang it up properly. My favorite photograph pretty much of any bison ever is this one here. It's from Keels Prairie Provinces, which is an online archive of Western Canadiana hosted by University of Alberta Libraries. I really love the intensity of the gaze in this photograph. My friends were like, you can't put a historical photo photograph on the cover, it's too black and white, too dour looking. So we found essentially the exact same photograph at Modern. Uh, and this one is by another colleague of mine, Jonathan Demore, and this is a wood bison at Elk Island. So it's the same intense gaze, but much brightly colored. We also wanted a cloud in the photo. So Cam broke out his Photoshop skills. This is a lie. The government has lied to you. This <laughs> photograph didn't actually have a storm in the background, like the cover would suggest. It's actually the same cloud on the back cover, which is a photograph from Grasslands <laughs> National Park. There was also only one small bison in the distance here. Tricks and Cam, Cam phot photoshopped several extras. It's the exact same bison silhouette, but it's from Grasslands and it's a beautiful thing. So now you're like, <gasps> is it not? <laughs> All of those are the same. <laughs> So this is the insider exclusive details on how we go about publishing a book with the federal government. Uh, but we thought that would be an appropriate and beautiful cover. We really wanted just to capture people's attention. With this book, I really want it to be interesting, engaging and accessible for people who don't know anything about Canadian history, who know nothing about bison, but That's also a lot of people, which is a lot of people, which is unfortunate because like anybody who thinks Canadian history is boring just doesn't know Canadian history because there's so many crazy things that have, have mm -hmm. happened and continue to happen. But I also really want it to be interesting, engaging um, and accessible to people who do know a lot about these subjects. As a lot of my friends who are working as biologists or ecologists or people who work in bison conservation abroad, I just sent some books down to the American Prairie Reserve. They're really interested because they sort of know the story from their perspective from when they received bison or they've worked with bison but don't necessarily know about history. Mm -hmm. And so it's really interesting for them to say, look at historical photographs of bison handling, like the Great Buffalo Roundup. You can see you're like, I wouldn't do it that way today. And, you know, <laughs> it's really interesting to see from a lot of different angles. So I wanted it to be of interest to a wide variety of audiences. All you really need to know is bison are really cool and they have a long history with lots of twists and turns and surprises along the way. What is your favorite thing about working in a national park? Oh my goodness, that's, that's that's a hard question to answer because there's a lot of cool things. I really enjoy getting paid to go hiking on occasion. I've done the working in the cubicle on the same project for you know weeks on end. And I like having the variety. I like 
every day being different. I do like getting the fresh air and exercise, which is quite nice. I enjoy that my traffic jams here are largely comprised of elk. At Elk Island, my traffic jams were largely comprised of bison in the road. There are worse problems to have in life. So I really enjoy, and I just enjoy the people I encounter, right? The people who work for national parks tend to be really enthusiastic people who are passionate about the subject, who are passionate about protecting nature and sharing those kinds of stories with the public. And the people who tend to come to national parks tend to be interested in these subjects. I always learn from my visitors as well. Why bison? Why not bison? There's something about bison that just attracts people. Like they have this depth of history and this human connection. When you spend any length of time with bison, there's just something about them that draws you in. The way they move, the way they they walk in this very deliberate way, their beards sway and things like that. There's fascinating beings. And there's so many interesting stories when it comes to bison. And again, at Elk Island National Park, um, that's really their thing. Like 80% of the messaging, 80% of the stuff they do are stories of bison conservation, the role of bison in the ecosystem, uh, the history of bison, the cultural connections with indigenous people, the story of near destruction, but also their conservation. We tell a lot of our own story now in terms of um, bison handling. Like I was very fortunate in that um, I was able to work over the course of several winters at Elk Island when they were doing projects like gathering bison to send them to places like Banff National Park, the Blackfeet Indian Nation in Montana, and being able to be with the veterinarian and with the, the biologist, with the ecologist. Like for me, I was just opening and closing gates uh, on the radio. But you were and there. I was there. I did take a hair sample at one point and I helped process fecal samples. <laughs> you haven't lived until, no, no. <laughs> um, but uh, no, it's incredibly fascinating. And for me, having those up close and personal encounters with bison, which are on their way to being you know, tested for their health and then sent off to exciting projects. Like I've, I've seen photographs of the bison now in Banff and I'm like, I saw you. <laughs> we had very close encounters. So I think it's really interesting and I, I really appreciate being a part of modern bison conservation. And I find that the, learning about the history of bison has really helped to inform my understanding of what's going on today, but also vice versa. Like knowing what I know about bison, like I've had to help, I've called it like babysitting bison before, where like a bison will get into like the day use area, like the picnic area, and we don't have time to herd them out, just too many visitors around. And so I've just, me and a colleague have just hung out at the edge of their awareness zone and intercepted people before they get too close. There was one individual who uh, parked himself at the bottom of the slide and took a nap <laughs> in the playground. The park's been doing a lot of work with like new visitor center, new washroom buildings and stuff. And it's not out of the question that we would have installed a bison statue. And a lot of people don't anticipate bison being in the picnic area. And they'll just be like, be free children, go and <laughs> go and play. And then they know this is a safe space. So all that being said, having up close personal encounters with bison has also helped inform the way I look at historical sources because I can really picture in my mind when they talk about how these bison move and, and when they're hunting bison or what have you, I can see in my mind's eye that. And sometimes you can be like, mm, that person probably never actually saw one. Because <laughs> sometimes that's also the case, especially with drawings. You're like, that's not how a bison stands. That's not how a bison moves. That looks really strange. But I find it really interesting because they have that depth of history. People talk about them being spiritual animals and I definitely see where that, that comes from because they have very intense gazes and they definitely have attitude, which is amazing. And they're one of the few Ice Age megafauna that yeah. are still around. Yeah, they evolved during the last Ice Age. Like, uh, it's hard to tell from this. This is a wood bison photograph. There's two different subspecies in North America. There's also a third in Europe in Poland actually and a couple other small places. Uh, bison Bonassus. And they look really weird because their babies are brown instead of orange and that's just weird. The ones in North America have orange babies. If you've ever seen a wood bison up close, and if you are I'd recommend there be a fence between you and them or in a vehicle. I've seen wood bison that are seven foot high at the hump. At Elk Island I think that they've had bison come through handling their 2,300 pounds, something like that. There are records of bison reaching two and a half, you know, like, you know, so like, <laughs> Yeah, they're, they are large animals. They are definitely megafauna and the people think of the same size as cows and they're not nope. really. Nope, <laughs> they are big. <laughs> Who is the one that came up with the idea to write this? That's a complicated question. <laughs> this is exactly how a project isn't supposed to be managed. <laughs> Essentially is what it was. This is insider information. There was a pot of funding that the field unit got between Elk Island and Prince Albert National Park that was all about trying to um, better share the story of bison and uh, interviews and, and, and things like that with local indigenous people and, and talk about really highlight and amplify these kinds of stories of bison conservation, uh, the history of bison, cultural connections and things like that. And in terms of the modern cultural connections and the modern uh, conservation work, you know, they knocked that out of the park, but they also created a very short document that was meant to be the National Bison Story. It's like a reference document for the history. And it was done in a bit of a rush. And I don't know who did it. And I don't want to speak 
poorly of them because they but they weren't a trained historian and they'd only had a couple sources mostly from the 1970s it wasn't really adequate enough to talk about the depth and breadth of bison history and so the superintendent Elkai at the time was like we need to do better and then of course the management team comes back and like will you do better uh, maybe we shouldn't actually record this part <laughs> but, no, no. Um, but you know they're um so uh we had to create this document to kind of support this pot of funding so we had a reference document but um there wasn't a lot of time to really write a proper document and the one that was produced didn't really highlight the depth and breadth of the, the story of bison nationally, particularly the story of wood bison, because their sources from the 1970s didn't really talk a lot about it. The superintendent at Elk Island was told like, well, we need to beef up this document, make it more robust and things like that. And he looks around and he's like, Lauren, you've been doing some research for some programs. And uh, I'm a historian. So I was like, oh, yes, sir. He asked me, you know, like, well, what would it take to make this a more national document, not just Elk Island focus? Well, Elk Island being the center of bison conservation, like a lot of Elk Island's history is the national story of bison. So I included extra sections um, from BAMP, beefed up some extra sections on other topics, particularly in the destinations where bison were sent. So we were, we were using it for this pot of money for these, um, for these programs as like a resource and a backgrounder. So it helped inform uh, Bison Backstage, uh, Bison Boot Camp, which is a, a school program and other, other programs like that. And some other public programming like the Pemmican program at Up Island and, uh, and Bison Tits. If you want a version of this, but as uh, staff members in uniform telling you the story with interactive elements and fake moustaches, you should go to Elk Island and watch Bison Tales. All that being said, we kind of had this good internal document and we were like, great. And it was reviewed by ecologists and biologists who worked for the team, but I was the one trained historian. Then we were asked by some folks in Banff National Park, which was really ramping up to reintroduce bison there. And they were like, can we share this with our stakeholders as a good document? We're like, uh, being government workers, we're then like, okay, we gotta run this up the line. And then we figured out, oh, it's actually not that difficult to publish a book federally. The difficult part is creating a document that the federal government has copyright over. That's the hard part, but we already written it. So we needed to make sure it was peer reviewed. And it was, it was not just peer reviewed by ecologists and biologists, but also by three historians working in Ottawa, specializing in the history of Western Canada and environmental history. And then we need to get it published in English and French. So we had to get it translated. So I reviewed the translation. I didn't translate it myself. I'm a French speaker, but I reviewed it for content, not grammar. The gal translated is wonderful woman. She was saying it was the most interesting document she's ever had to translate in her 15 year career with the federal government. Cool. I mean, I'm not sure how high the bar is, <laughs> you know, but I was really excited. Still a good one to hit though. I know. The original intention was a very short reference document for a very specific project. And it ballooned mostly because of internal and popular demand, which I think was very gratifying. Of, yeah. Like, we want to make sure that this is a document we can share with the public. How do we go about doing that? because we have to make sure it's a reputable document. I would want it to be an engaging and interesting and useful document, yes. you know, uh, which is also the priority of the field unit. What is your favorite piece of trivia that you discovered while researching? At the Great Buffalo Roundup of 1907, there was an amazing newspaper account that I read. It's three full newspaper pages, six columns, of dense text from this guy who was like, this is the most amazing thing ever. So you got some amazing details that I've found pretty much only in that newspaper account. There's a lot of photographers who were there. There was essentially 800 wild bison being sent up by Blackfoot and Mexican cowboys over the course of five years to Elk Island National Park and a now defunct park called Buffalo National Park. But one of the details there was there was a group of elderly bison in that herd that had brass caps on their horns. Because Michel Pablo and Charles Allard had supplemented their herd with additional bison from a guy called Charles Jesse Buffalo Jones, which is a Wild West name for you. He had a Wild West show and he put brass caps in the horns of some of his bison. And I was like, what? Anyway, I have a blog post about it. It's not, a, or that mentions it. It's not in the book. That is all the questions I have about this particular book. Are there going to be more publications from you coming? That's, fiction or nonfiction? That's a good question. I need to get more in the habit of writing again, but yeah. I'm going to be yeah. living in the depths of Northern Saskatchewan this winter. And there's only so much snowshoeing you can do after work. So I anticipate working on some other projects. I would like to write a book entirely about the Great Buffalo Roundup of 1907, 08, 09. Uh, there were three photographers and one sketch artist and a bunch of newspaper men who came out because it was like they were herding dinosaurs. Like this was like, there were people who believed genuinely at that time that the last of the buffalo were extinct. So there's some really, really amazing accounts and there are people who were late, who later became famous or more well-known who were also there. And so I think that there's a lot of really cool opportunities to really expand on that history because <laughs> like the more I look into these photographs and delve in like, what? There was a, like, it, there's some crazy stories. So I'd love to write more of a book on that. I also would Historical love- Historical fiction or nonfiction? Nonfiction. 
But, because you should also do a historical fiction. That would be great. <laughs> the other one I would love to write, I've been thinking about this off and on for a while, but I'd love to write like an anecdotal history of Elk Island nonfiction through the conceit of different wildlife. So going through and really gathering some of the stories from old wardens and things like that, and maybe frame it with like, you have a chapter on elk as the introduction, so it's found in an elk preserve, hence, Elk Island National Park, chapter on bison, chapter on trumpeter swan, maybe beaver reintroduction too, because that's also a crazy story. And like, it'd be really cool by just using animals as a framing device. I'd I, read that. You would read that? I hope other people would read it. I would write it for my own interest, but it'd be great if other people would read it too. So I think those are kind of, those are stories that I would like to write more of because I think environmental history is really incredibly interesting and really also helps inform current management practices and mm -hmm. current conservation and future the way we envision our world, really. Again, as I was saying, if you think Canadian history is boring, you don't know Canadian history. The stuff you have to learn in school isn't always that interesting. Yeah, it's really not. <laughs> Which is so unfortunate because you can't make this stuff up. There's so many cool things that have happened in this territory. See, we needed history teachers like you in school. Right? I can't be everywhere, but you should come to some of my programs. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, I personally invite people if you have any questions about bison, you can tell I love to talk. Feel free to send me a message on my blog or on Twitter at History Boots. One of the things I always like to highlight is just how close we came to losing bison. And I think it's really important that people understand that all bison today are descended from essentially seven discrete populations. Five of them wild caught and raised by people like Michel Pablo, Charles Allard, prior to them, Atatitsa, Latatitsa, Peregrine Falcon Robe and Little Peregrine Falcon Robe and walking coyote. They, they're all these really great names. Uh, but there's also two herds that were founded, uh, that had uh, national parks founded around them. Yellowstone, but Yellowstone's not unique. They talk about themselves like they're unique, but there's also Wood Buffalo <laughs> National Park. But I think, you know, we came incredibly close to losing them. We came like a hair's breadth away. And it's shocking that we have bison at all today. There's a lot of challenges that bison face today, but despite going through such a tight genetic bottleneck, because all of our genetics come from these seven discrete populations, which were geographically removed from each other, we have a decent amount of genetic variability in the bison. It depends on the herd, obviously. Mm -hmm. The early history of bison conservation, to me, is really interesting in part also because it's so alarming, because it could have gone another way. But mm -hmm. there's just so many people who've been involved from day one who are really passionate about bison and want to keep them in the world. And it's still work being done today. Like, we say through the storm as if we're through it and we're done. But there's still a lot of work that needs to be done today. I think the first step in bison conservation is people learning about the story. We've gone through, in many places, many generations without bison on the landscape. And I think it's really important that people reconnect in general with, with nature because we, we are often quite divorced from it. But yes. particularly when it comes to bison, because I think people don't know how to interact with them, maybe are scared of them. But I mean, cows are dangerous too. I would I would be much more scared of a cow than I would be of a bison because cows are much more unpredictable in their behavior, in my experience anyway. Reconnect with bison. Like, where are your local bison herds? There are, they are definitely around, particularly if you're in Western North America or even in Mexico, there's pebble herds in Mexico. Reconnect with your bison. Come to learn more about them. Learn about their story. What are they like and what does it take to bring them back on the landscape? So that is all I got for you today. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked this video, give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. If you'd like to be notified as soon as I upload, then a ring that bell. I will put all the links to everything Lauren has mentioned in the description below so you can check it out. My upcoming contemporary romance novel is available for pre-sale now. It is right behind Lauren's head, heart and soul. You can read the first three chapters, they're available on my website, and if you pre-order, you can have a chance to enter the pre-sale giveaway for a chance to win some awesome prizes. And if romance isn't your thing, you can check out my first two books, Olympian Confessions, Hades and Persephone, and Olympian Confessions, Hera. They are both available now in ebook and paperback. They're so good. <laughs> And I will see you all next week with another video. Bye! Now I've been lovingly anointed by your cat's hair. Um, Hello! <laughs> what a beautiful cat. No, I'm always like, am I allowed to talk about this? <laughs> I think I'm allowed to talk about this.